So I'm Cathy Pritchard-Jones, I'm Professor of Paediatric Oncology at University College London Institute of Child Health and Great Ormond Street Hospital. So Wilms tumour is a form of kidney cancer that really only occurs in children. It's named after a German doctor who first described children with this kidney cancer way back in the 1800s. Now children's uh, kidney cancers don't look like adult kidney cancers. Uh, we don't know what causes them in the main but they look like the developing kidney in a baby before it's born, but in a much more disorganised fashion. So each year in the UK, there's about 80 children a year are diagnosed with Wilms tumour. That means the risk to an individual child of ever getting Wilms tumour in their lifetime is about 1 in 10,000. So you can see it's rare. So when a child is discovered to have a, a big lump in their kidney and cancer is suspected, they'll usually be seen first at the local children's hospital or paediatric ward where they'll have had an ultrasound. So this will tell us if the tumour is confined to the kidney or not. The child will then get sent to a specialist children's cancer centre, which may be some distance away, and there they will have more scans called CT scans, possibly an MRI scan. Uh, when a child's diagnosed with a Wilms tumour, the first thing the doctors will want to look at is has the uh, cancer spread anywhere else in the body and does it affect the only one kidney or the opposite kidney. So this is something that we call tumour staging. So initially we can group Wilms tumours into one of three groups. The tumour's either localised, so it's not outside the kidney, it's spread to the lungs, uh, which we call metastatic disease, or it Sometimes, in about 1 in 20 cases, there's also a lump in the other kidney that we call bilateral disease or stage 5. For most children with Wilms tumour, we don't know what, what caused it, and that's true of about 95%. It just seems to be bad luck out of the blue, that um, one of the many billions of cells in the developing kidney goes wrong by chance. However, in about 5% of children, so that's 1 in 20, there's something else wrong with the child that suggests they've been born with an increased risk of getting a Wilms tumour. So about 1-2% to of children with Wilms tumour have a problem with their iris, that's the coloured part of the eye, and it can be missing, and this is called aniridia. And there's a very well-known association between loss of the iris and an increased risk of Wilms tumour. And some children will have other abnormalities of the development of their genital organs associated with an increased risk of Wilms tumour. And, and both of these syndromes are usually associated with the child being born with an abnormality in a gene that's called the Wilms tumour 1 gene, or WT1. There's then another group of children who have what we call overgrowth syndromes, the commonest of which is beckwith Wiedemann syndrome. And this is even more complicated than WT1 gene. Uh, children are born with overactive copies of a gene that has a growth factor called insulin-like growth factor 2. And this is present throughout their body and it seems to increase the risk of Wilms tumour. In 1-2% to 2 of all children with Wilms tumour, there's somebody else in the family who's had it before. So we call this familial Wilms tumour. And if this is the case, uh, the child and the parents will be referred to a geneticist and they'll take blood samples and they'll look for the genes that we know about at the moment that can cause Wilms tumour to run in families. But I think the headline message is it's very uncommon for Wilms tumour to run in families. And if your child's had Wilms tumour just affecting one kidney, assuming that they will beat and survive their cancer, it's unlikely that their children or their brothers and sisters would have Wilms tumour. So Wilms tumour is treated with a combination of surgery, chemotherapy and sometimes radiotherapy. And exactly how many drugs, chemotherapy drugs a child needs and how long the treatment needs to go on for depend on something we call risk stratification. So we need to look at the combination of tumour stage, which is how far the tumour spread and how easy it was for the operation to remove the tumour and how the tumour looks down the microscope, which we call histology. And we have three 
histological risk groups, low, medium and high risk. And we put all of that together to decide on an individual treatment for each child. So in Europe, we give chemotherapy first for a short period of time, about a month, then an operation to remove the kidney that's got the tumour in it, and then there'll be more chemotherapy and sometimes radiotherapy afterwards. There is an alternative approach which the North Americans use, which is to do the surgery straight away and then decide how much treatment to give the child after they've seen what the specimen looks like that is removed from the patient. So there has been research to compare the two approaches and the UK led on this research but it's shown the two approaches are equivalent in terms of your chance of survival. So the follow-up for your child after they finish treatment for Wilms tumour will depend a little bit on what treatment they've already had. So all children will be followed at regular intervals with ultrasound scans of their tummies and chest x-rays to check the tumour's not coming back. But that doesn't need to go on lifelong, usually for about two to three years, after which the risk of relapse is pretty small. The follow-up then switches to how do you stay healthy with only one kidney, and especially if you've maybe had treatments like doxorubicin that can affect your heart longer term, or you've had radiotherapy. So a child will get a personalised follow-up plan, which will go on for the rest of their life according to the treatment they've received. If they've only had minimum chemotherapy, we don't really anticipate any side effects long term. But any child who's had a kidney removed should have at least once a year a check of their blood pressure and a measurement that there's no protein in their urine. Uh, children who've had doxorubicin will need to have a heart test usually about once every five years, and that's just an ultrasound scan or an echocardiogram, so it doesn't hurt. Um, if they've had radiotherapy, we'll want to keep an eye on their growth, um, and there is a small increased risk of getting another cancer because of the cancer treatment you had in the first place, but that risk is very small for children who've been treated for Wilms tumour. So Wilms tumour is a childhood cancer that's got a very good survival rate, but still, one in ten children will not survive the disease. So doctors and scientists are continually trying to improve treatment for children with Wilms tumour. And there are two main questions we're trying to answer. For the nine out of ten that we can cure with our current treatments, we'd like to make those treatments safer, possibly use different drugs, and, and so they have fewer side effects long term. In general, that means trying to use less radiotherapy and less of a drug called doxorubicin because that can have problems um, with the heart muscle in later life. And we've come a long way uh, to answering that question. Uh, the UK took part in a randomised clinical trial that was international across the world and it showed that it was safe to remove doxorubicin from the chemotherapy of a certain group of children with Wilms tumour. So now, only about one in four children with Wilms tumour need radiotherapy, and a similar proportion will have the drug doxorubicin. But the bigger challenge is the one in ten children with high-risk Wilms tumour who currently do not survive. Now, most of these children will have done okay at the beginning. They will have usually responded, been able to have an operation, and may well have finished their chemotherapy. The challenge is that the tumour comes back, so we call that relapse, and it can either relapse in the lungs or less commonly in fact in the abdomen or the tumour bed where the tumour first started. Now relapsed Wilms tumour, particularly if the initial treatment was quite strong, had a lot of drugs in it, um, is not so successful. If you, on average about half of children that relapse will survive but if they've had lots of treatment first time round, then only 10 to 20 percent will survive. So in order to make progress with improving treatments for the one in 10 children who still die of Wilms tumour, we need to understand much more about what's going on inside those tumour cells at a DNA or genetic level. But of course we have to compare the, the bad tumours, if you like, to the good tumours, so we are actually uh, collecting DNA and blood samples from all children diagnosed with Wilms tumour in the UK and across Europe at the moment. 
and we're analysing what's happening to the genes inside those tumours and then seeing what happens to those ch children with the current standard treatment over the next few years. So early in 2015, there was a big breakthrough in understanding the genes that go wrong in high-risk Wilms tumour. And the research groups in Europe and America published at the same time and found many, many genes in common. Now, so it's good to understand why Wilms tumours have happened. These genes are involved in normal kidney development and they've gone wrong in the Wilms tumours. So the genes that we found are going wrong in high-risk Wilms tumour are not very common, so they're not found in all the Wilms tumours. As of yet, they don't directly point to a new drug that we could use for these children, though. So more research needs to be done to understand how these genes are affecting the cell growth and behaviour before we can turn that into a new treatment. So whilst most children with Wilms tumour will beat their cancer and grow up to be adults, still one in ten children dies of their Wilms tumour. This is a terrible situation that we really want to improve and we need more research. And this research is focused on high-risk Wilms tumour to understand the genetics inside the tumour and link that to new, more effective cancer drugs.